Originality is rare in modern day Hollywood. With all these Ghostbuster reboots, shockingly we haven't seen a de-aged, practically animated Bill Murray yet. Though 10 reboots down the line, we may have to actually reanimate his corpse. I wouldn't put it past them. The one visionary, with a passion for cinema and a pocket full of billions, had what he thought was an idea that would change cinema forever, as he looked to reshape the silver screen in his own ingenious image. Forget the likes of acclaimed and award-winning icons such as Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese, meet property developer John Yang. Scouring through articles involving Yang, little is revealed about his personal life, with the consensus being that he's a film-obsessed real estate guy. But in an interview with New York Times in 2010, paints an extremely focused individual, meticulous as far as his own film goes, and overall very carefree when commenting on the work of fellow Chinese directors. When describing his vision for Empires of the Deep, Yang said, My idea is to make movies on the biggest scale there is. I want it to be epic. That alone should tell you all you need to know about the aspiring world beater. Though the problem with this mindset is that he thought he was somehow already at the very top as far as filmmakers go, considering himself alongside the likes of Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson, though the only experience he's had when it comes to films is the admittance that he's watched 4,000 of them. With Empires of the Deep, Yang was set out to create a very serious love tragedy that is a combination of something mystical, something that satisfies your bloodlust, and something sensual, with the likes of Transformers and Shakespeare being among some of his inspirations, which as far as narrative creativity goes, you gotta admit he had a vision, perhaps psychically cast down to him by motion picture icon himself, Ed Wood. Yang, in his mind, saw this film as being the beginning of a trilogy, followed by a video game and theme park tie-in. He was convinced that his movie was going to be a phenomenon. Now there's a reason why Yang hasn't yet become a household name. Part of it has to do with the script, which he himself had written, Empires of the Deep, though the title went through various other iterations, like Mermaid Island USA vs the Plesiosaurus. And the other part of why Yang is still fairly obscure, at least in the Western world, is because the film itself was never actually released, much to the Oscars' disappointment. We lost, by the way, but, you know. Guys, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> Built as China's answer to James Cameron's Avatar, however, the plot would have followed, at least in one version of the movie's many drafts, the story of an unlikely love between a young human and a mermaid. Now there is a longer version of the plot here, and just so you're aware of how incredibly batshit this all sounds, I'm gonna read it out to you, okay? You ready? Alright, so... The eight mermaid kingdoms have reigned as the protectors of the ocean since the creation of Earth, but the current peace comes under threat from the re-emergence of the demon mage and his legions. After his village is caught up in the conflict, a Greek hero named Atlas sets out with his friend Trajan to rescue Atlas's father and bring back the holy temple of Poseidon, which has been stolen by an army of mermen knights. Yeah, you can tell this movie went through 40 drafts, but on the 30th, I would have just nailed the script to the desk. Delving deeper, Atlas apparently has an alter ego, Silver Eye, who emerges in moments of grave danger. When celebrating in his native Greece, an army of mermen knights, led by the demon mage, travelling atop giant crabs, kidnaps Atlas's adoptive father, General Deimos, and the Temple of Poseidon. A temple. Giant crabs run off with a temple. Now the script isn't available on the net, though an article I found, written by Mitch Moxley, whose article I'll be using for the bulk of info on this story, check it out in the description, features an interview with one of the film's many directors, who we'll get to later, so I'll mention a few of the scenes here, and just so I don't get an email from an angry journalist, you can find those scenes in more detail at Mitch's article. So Atlas and his friend Trajan attempt to retrieve both father and temple. On their journey, they come across Crab Island and a horde of witches who make love to men before murdering them in their bed. Once Atlas and his pal find out about this horrible scheme, the palace itself begins to crumble. And a short while later, it's revealed that the palace itself is built on top of a 450 foot long fish. It's saved mid-battle by good mermen operating spiral shelled vehicles, but the windows are somehow made of jellyfish skin, and the front is being pulled and operated by giant bloody sea monsters. It's all totally normal in Greece. Atlas and Trajan are taken to Mermaid Island, where the eight fairy kingdoms are set to do battle with the demon mage. 
Once the fight begins, however, a twist so nonsensical, my two remaining brain cells combine to create enough intelligence to off itself, it is revealed that Atlas was the demon mage all along. There's even crazier shit here by the way, so stick along for the ride. We'll get to it. There are strict rules imposed by the Chinese government regarding what can and can't be shown at the movies, which leads to rather huge restrictions when writing a script. Because of this, the result tends to portray the Chinese people and its government in an overly positive light. Western movies like Joker and World War Z were totally banned for showing things that don't conform to Chinese tradition. Maybe they benefited from the latter. And foreign films are restricted to only 20 per year. Though with the film industry growing at a significant rate, filmmakers look to create America Chinese co-productions to capitalize on a venture they thought could generate them the big bucks. The majority were bad, bogged down by terrible scripts and language barriers on set, but then Yang came along. His script too was viewed by the government as problematic, though the changes made were only to be viewed by Chinese audiences, such as a race of dragon people shoehorned into a script already overflown with webbed freaks, and also the appearance of famous Chinese actor Hu Yun. Empires of the Deep was also a co-production with Hollywood, though the company they supposedly collaborated with, Imagine Studios, was also owned by John Yang. The script was altered on a consistent basis, passing through over 10 screenwriters in the process, each adding to the story, though Yang was very strict on what stuck and what didn't. He wanted a very accurate portrayal, mind to screen of all of his webbed fantasies, and no one was going to swim in his way. One of the screenwriters, Randall Frakes, a friend of James Cameron himself, was hired to write the English version of the film's treatment, and he had this to say. Due to the nature of the subject matter and the original writer's concepts, which were at best muddled and at worst incomprehensible to an international audience, I did not hold out much hope of this being accepted by the general public, either in Europe, the States, or even in China. Upon meeting Yang, Randall was very straightforward in admitting that the script needed a lot of work, pointing out that the vast majority of set pieces were directly taken from well-known Hollywood movies, like Indiana Jones. Yang agreed that they were directly taken from well-known Hollywood movies, but was adamant that they stayed in the script. Yang then revealed that he wanted Irvin Kirshner, director of Empire Strikes Back, to direct his movie. He sent Randall over to Los Angeles to essentially negotiate with Kirshner, but once there, they came up with an alternate version of Yang's script, set in modern day, about a group of characters who discover an underwater kingdom. Kirshner was on board for this version. Yang wasn't. Randall and Kirshner then left the project. Yang sought to cast a major American film star next, a familiar face they could market to their Western audience, and so for the lead mermaid, they had their sights firmly set on Sharon Stone. She declined. Monica Bellucci too, but she had no interest in the script. Next up was Olga Kurilenko, fresh off of her appearance in Quantum of Solace. She accepted, forming a bond with the story and the character she was set to portray. All Western actors with even a slither of credibility staying as far West as possible. The rest of the cast was made up of unknowns, just happy to be there, I suppose. Now they had to get a director on board the sinking ship, with French filmmaker Pitoff in the running. Pitoff is mostly known for his adaptation of Catwoman, which was released in 2004 to just rave reviews. I was at the top, and then Catwoman just plummeted me to the bottom. Paid around 400k up front, Pitoff agreed. He hired friend Michael Ryan, who had written mainly animation to do rewrites. Pitoff said the script that Ryan wrote was like 2010's Clash of Titans, but with better set pieces and more humour. Yang hated it and called Ryan a bad writer. Pitoff abandoned the project. Yang's final hope, what he thought was his very last resort I suppose, was Steven Spielberg's superfan Jonathan Lawrence, someone who he had met earlier on but quickly discarded due to lack of experience. Lawrence was an odd choice, considering he had only directed one feature, a few commercials and a string of music videos, but his longtime friend Mark Byers brought to his attention an opportunity to direct something on a scale he had never thought possible. Lawrence, a longtime lover of film after seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time as a teenager, dedicated his entire life to be just like his hero Steven Spielberg. He wore the Indiana Jones hat everywhere he went even attended California State University, Spielberg's old school. 
His latest work up until that point was an Indiana Jones fan film in Europe he had directed. Unpaid, but it was a labour of love. After hearing of Yang and his ideas for the first time, Lawrence was enthralled. This was his big opportunity. He's found a billionaire, someone with the funds to create something on the scale of his hero, Steven Spielberg, a like-minded filmmaker with a zaniness only he could relate to. Lawrence had directed just one feature, 1999's Dream Parlor, though the movie wasn't a financial success. But everything I've seen from Lawrence, he seems really sweet, and it's a damn shame this didn't work out for him. The whole interview where he goes into detail though on the movie, and how he got into film, is so fucking surreal. Take a look. Hi, we're the Space Twins, and welcome to My Outer Space TV. I'm number one, and I'm number two. Wait, I thought I was number one. Me too. Today we're here with director and cinematographer, Jonathan Lawrence. Hello ladies, number one, number two. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so let's begin with um, anything recent that you've been up to, what's going on? Yes, yes, actually. I just got back from a, a, a big uh, movie in China. Nice. Huge, huge movie called Empires of the Deep. Uh, it's it's uh, fantasy, sci-fi elements. Uh, it's actually China's uh, biggest special effects film ever. So did you learn anything in Chinese? You mean like speak Chinese? Yeah, do you yes. have to learn? Anything? Yes, the, the only thing I remember is Shabi. <laughs> what does that mean, if you can tell us? I'm effing done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. Um, can you tell us, what do the sci-fi fanatics have to look forward to with this production? Some of the most amazing effects that you've seen, and, and I know we've all seen Avatar now, and we all mm -hmm. love the effects in that. Where did it all get started? Where did you, you know, get started? Um, actually, uh, as a kid, uh, two things happened. Um, one, I, 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 I was a little kid and I fell off the toilet seat and I broke my collarbone, uh, but it didn't really hurt, so I thought, I can be a stuntman. Uh, in my late 20s, I'm gonna say, um, I, I, I said, I, I'm tired of trying to get my break, I'm gonna make it happen. So I hooked up with an actor, a uh, writer friend, and we wrote this script called Dream Parlor. Um, and, uh, and we just said, okay, you know, we, we're, we're just gonna make this. And we started making our plans, and we started making we started making this film. And it took us two years of weekends to create this uh, wow. hundred thousand, twelve years ago, hundred thousand dollar sci-fi movie. Mm -hmm. And we were building sets from the ground up because my friend Salvi Malachi was getting me into the studios. She was working on all these shows like Godzilla and all this stuff. And every time they'd wrap, they'd go, "Come pick this stuff up. You can have it. Just come pick oh, it up." Wow. So we were going to like Alien Resurrection, and we were going to Godzilla, and they were and they were just getting rid of all this stuff. And we were, "This is great." So we start building all these sets. My friend gave us a warehouse to shoot in, and we built these sets. And and I taught myself uh, 3D animation for that film. Um, and, and over about a two and a half uh, year period of weekends, we made this film. So big thank you to director Jonathan Lawrence for being here today with us to tell us about your amazing project. Um, we definitely look forward to it, and I'm sure all those sci-fi fanatics out there look forward to it too. I'm number one, and I'm number two. For My Outer Space TV. So Yang and Lawrence met to discuss empires, and their very first meeting went as followed. Yang wasn't anything like what Lawrence had envisioned, probably reliving the exact same feeling he had when reading the script. What the fuck is going on? Because Yang was apprehensive and a bit rude, not feeling like Lawrence was worthy of his time. It didn't help that they had a translator in between them, so major talking points and ideas might have got lost in translation. Yang told him, Why would I want you if you haven't done anything of note? If you can go out and make a scene that's as big as Transformers, I'll consider you. Must have been a bit awkward with all these insults coming from the translator. I feel like this may have been one of the instances where I quite literally would have shot the messenger. After the meeting, both left feeling hard done by. Lawrence especially, as he didn't hear back from Yang until two years later. Little progress was made in those two years as far as directors went, but once again, Lawrence's friend Mark Byers made him aware that Empires of the Deep needed someone new to helm the movie. And at that point, Yang was the casting director, and he had hired an agency in Los Angeles to find him some actors. Though at this rate, Yang himself was going to have to glue on some scales and strap a GoPro to his head to get this thing rolling. Lawrence attended one of these casting sessions and sent his picks over to Yang on who should star in the movie, but Yang had already decided. He had casted Shi Yanfei to play the mermaid princess, though she was also Yang's girlfriend at the time. Olga Kurilenko, as I mentioned earlier, was officially cast and paid $1 million for her role. Other parts, big and small, 
when they're relatively unknown actors. Once who had only starred in small, straight-to-DVD indie films, the role of Atlas went to Stephen Politis, having recently graduated from theatre school in Baltimore, and the role of Atlas's psychic Trajan went to Max Morlian, who had primarily starred in those small, no-budget independent films. Jonathan Cost Reed was cast as the villain, an American actor big in China, but unknown in the US, someone who profited massively from the big spike in moviegoing popularity in China. In the time Lawrence was away, Yang started up a special effects company called Fontalese Pictures to handle, you guessed it, the special effects for the movie. And when Lawrence flew to Beijing to meet up with Yang once again, he went straight to the Fontalese offices. There he saw that pre-production was now very much underway. Massive sets, creature costumes, the lot was there to greet him. He met with Yang, who was much friendlier, thankfully. The translator was there too, but he didn't have to go through the hassle of calling Lawrence unworthy to his face anymore, which was a plus. A few days later, Lawrence entered a warehouse full to the brim with weapons and costumes, though it was revealed a little while later that these were all of the props that Yang had rejected. He then visited various sound stages where sets and locations were in the process of being built. For one scene involving an ancient prison, Lawrence noticed the parts of the sets were pristine, while others were made to look old and dirty. For an ancient prison, Lawrence realised the lack of continuity and ordered changes right away. Lawrence also made changes to the script, fearing that the protagonist, who ends up going on a massive killing spree right in the middle of the movie, wasn't likeable enough. He also wrote in a love interest for our boy Atlas, as well as amending some other narrative inconsistencies. But Yang wasn't happy, and it all came to a head in a heated argument where Lawrence finally had the balls to say what nobody else would. He said, Your script is one of the worst pieces of fucking shit I've ever read. The translator wouldn't translate that particular comment. What a coward. Though Yang got the gist of it, and doubted Lawrence's credibility as a writer saying that nobody would take him seriously because he hasn't got a writing credit on IMDb. To which Lawrence responded, Neither do you. If only he could see you now, Jonathan. Fast forward to 2009, where pre-production had been going about as smoothly as a coke deal in a hailstorm, and actual production had been given the go-ahead for December of that year. Lawrence then met the two leads, Politis and Morlian, and warned them that everything changes here from moment to moment. What is true today will not be true tomorrow. Politis and Morlian were taken away to try in various outfits then, with Politis having grown out his hair to match the concept art. But his hair was changed numerous times over the course of the week to appease the ever-evolving script. Politis said, I had curly brown hair. It seemed perfect for the part of an ancient Greek warrior. Fast forward to me meeting everyone fresh off the plane, I had worn a hat and everyone seemed concerned when my hair was not as curly as when I auditioned. I tried to no avail to communicate the concept of hat head. I was suddenly in a chair and had seven people prodding and poking at my hair. After trying on a wig or two, they proceeded to usher me off to a salon where they permed, bleached, cut, dyed my hair. My hair would come out white, orange, green, and when they hit blonde, they figured that was good enough. It looked horrible. I thought, how the hell am I going to look heroic like this? But overall, the costumes looked cheap, and the language barriers on set were becoming an issue, and the mermen suits were ragged, and had to be physically glued to the actor's skin to stay on. One of the actor's skin became irritated, so he went over to inspect the glue bottle, and found that on the side it said, Avoid contact with skin. And the mermaid suits weren't much better. Lawrence wanted easy to manoeuvre costumes, so actresses could get around on set without any problem. He was then provided with the opposite. Meanwhile, Leeds, Politis and Morlian became good friends, equally astounded and grateful for this type of opportunity, considering the lack of experience. And locals were asking for their autographs and everything. Life was good. Though in December, when Yang had called for production to begin, they weren't allowed to do any rehearsals. Plus, the script was still being rewritten. Lawrence was trying to work around the scenes that had to be included for Chinese audiences only, but that was proving to be difficult. And before shooting, there was a ceremony that took place where they blessed the very expensive Panasonic cameras, covering them in red blankets and lighting candles. But after that though, the real work began. And the opening scene involved a horse and an apple, 
but things quickly devolved when the horse wouldn't do as he was told, and Morlian's character kept dropping the apple that was to be thrown to him. Man, who fucking blessed these cameras? Jesus Christ! Put on! Huh. Politus said, The first horse I rode, they tracked miles to the set. You could tell it was worn out, and when I got up close, I noticed that its black coat had an interesting colour. Upon further inspection, I realised they had spray painted a brown horse black to match the other horse we were going to use. Then Lawrence became acquainted with the cinematographer Rao Chaobing, well respected but no nonsense kind of guy, not a fan of multiple takes. And the Western actors there felt the film was being rushed, but Yang could only go so long without his sea life erotica. The Western actors in question, Politis and Morlian, were totally devoid of a trailer unlike most movie stars, and weren't handed the majority of things promised in their contracts. They were fed the same food each day, chicken, broccoli and rice, which proved to be an issue for Morlian, who was set to portray a bigger character on screen, and after losing weight, he asked his mother to send him food from back home in the US. On set, disagreements between Lawrence and Rao proved to be rather time consuming, resulting in some shots taking over five hours to set up. Yang was really on set, but one time, when consulting some of the actors, he told Politis, I want to make you into a big star. And according to Politis, he once worked 22 hours in a single day, and all he was fed was a soggy ham sandwich. Weeks of shooting went by with typically poor results, and in the end filming was moved to Fujian province, but the weather there proved to be hazardous, as late arrivals on set began to voice their frustrations with the whole ordeal. Then things got, uh, violent. Lawrence saw two crew members fighting, and a camera operator being kicked in the head. He tried to step in, but was told not to get involved. This was followed by a stuntman quitting, because being pulled around on ropes for the entire day is quite painful. And when shooting in a cave, a giant rock fell from the ceiling and crushed a spotlight. They also filmed some scenes in a dodgy diving tank, where Politis had this to say. At one point, we were shooting there all day for about a week straight. You could tell they were just dumping more and more chlorine into the pool to clean it. It got to the point where I couldn't keep my eyes open out of the water because it hurt so bad. I'd have to feel my way back to the hotel room because it was so painful and blurry. I'd wake up with both eyes just crusted shut from them cleaning themselves out. Irina Violet, cast as Mermaid Dada, was not enjoying her experiences so far on set either. They had to shoot on a rocky riverbed, out in the middle of nowhere, in the cold, and there were absolutely no safety assurances in place at all. Yang's underlings spouted the very assuring message that Yang himself said it was all probably safe. So with no shooting scheduled in place, and being forced to shoot whenever the cinematographer and assistant director felt like it, Irina was done, and then proceeded to tell Lawrence, who relayed back to her, that Yang was planning on firing her anyway. As stated in her contract, she was owed a ticket home, but she never got one was told to repay all of her wages thus far, essentially being kept there against her will until she paid up. So Irina talked with Lawrence to plan an escape. One night, Lawrence called a production meeting while Irina and her boyfriend quietly exited the hotel, crossed a riverbank nearby, travelled through water, and found a police station. The officers drove them to a train station, and from there they went to the airport and eventually flew back to LA, traumatised and drenched in swamp water. At Ogre School, he would have gotten an A+. Lawrence told the crew that Irina and her boyfriend were still present, just hanging out in their hotel rooms, even carrying them up trays of food, which he proceeded to throw out of the empty room's window. People below in astonishment as to why it's raining fucking chicken nuggets. But Lawrence had to reveal, eventually, to the rest of the crew that Irina was gone, and a short while later, they found a replacement in Kerry Brogan. But he kept up the lie long enough for Irina to fly back home safely. Though Lawrence was growing tired of all the shenanigans too, and asked Yang if he could leave the project. He was paid a million dollars for his service, much to the annoyance of Yang, who asked Lawrence on his way out, Do you know any other Hollywood directors? So we say goodbye to Lawrence. It was good knowing you, chap. Next up was Michael French, a Canadian director who had been shooting in China anyway, a movie called Heart of a Dragon, and had connections with people on the set of Empires. Upon hiring, he was told not to speak with Lawrence at all. 
Though things got rolling, and the feel on the set was much more positive, in the span of a few months, Michael French had shot the majority of the film. Following the enthusiasm, a press conference was called, where they showed off some scenes from the movie, and for some reason had Olga Kurilenko, the Mermaid Queen, speak Chinese. Seriously though, this press conference is something else. And following the conference, where things looked to almost be wrapped up, Yang was still adding scenes into the movie, and threatened that French stay and shoot it, or else he wouldn't get paid. Michael French left the movie. Other crew members at this time, and even actors, were complaining that they weren't getting paid, despite doing exactly as Yang was telling them to. People threatened to follow French and Lawrence and all those who came before by walking, but high-ranking members of production called the police and had to essentially spook these actors into staying. What the fuck? Plus, they couldn't anyway because the suits were stuck to their skin. So finally, we meet Scott Miller, a fairly unknown filmmaker, but was acquainted with those who were working on Empires. He was much more jovial about his time on set, and overall had a good experience. And aside from Yang himself, he was one of the only ones who could get through to the maniacal billionaire. He also made sure the cast was fed properly, and worked with individuals on their performances. Miller wanted to reshoot the entire thing, but that just wasn't feasible. Meanwhile, lead actor Max Morlian couldn't bear the rigorous schedule and conflicting directions. On top of that, he wasn't even getting paid, so he left. Stephen Politis, on the other hand, our boy Atlas, stuck it out in the end and remained to film the rest of his scenes, though production looked to be done. They fought through all the hardships and Jonathan Yang's, so now all they had to do was edit and release the movie to wide acclaim. about what Empires of the Deep is. Yes. Okay, well, 
it's a pretty exciting project that uh, has been taking place here in China. And what it is is Empires of the Deep is a movie uh, that's being filmed in 3D, and it is a collaboration between uh, U.S. and uh, Chinese company, and it's the first uh, all English-made movie of its size that's ever been made in China. It, it is also the biggest budget movie that's ever been made in China. It's mm -hmm. over 100 million U.S. And I think the closest one to it was Hero, which I think was about 80 million. So, so by far this is the the biggest movie ever made here. Uh, you know, it's kind of like Avatar. And actually, we even use we we even uh, use the Avatar equipment. So they ship the Avatar equipment from California to China, and the Avatar 3D equipment was what was used. And that equipment happened to have been designed. Uh, there's other 3D equipment, but the, the stuff we used was the stuff that was actually designed by James Cameron. So if you could see the photo, you would see me as the Merman General. I played General Dole, General of the Merman Army. <laughs> and in this particular shot, uh, the Queen is running to me because this is my death scene because I die in this movie. Oh, and no! after, a, after a battle, yeah. So, uh, so You're playing, uh, you, and apparently at some point you ride on the back of a lobster? Oh, no. No, I ride, I, I ride uh, giant crabs into battle. Yeah. Well, as well we all should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so you're, you're like one of the major stars of this movie here dying uh, in the movie. Well, I, wouldn't, I don't know if major star might be a stretch, but, but I, I got some lines in the movie and I was happy about that. <laughs> so, uh, I have some of the lines. Can you remember some of them? Oh, well, there's one part where the queen is, uh, she's saying, you know, how did I get such a gen She always gives me a bad time, see. Uh -huh. Until the end, then she, but you'll have to see the movie to find out. But uh, so she's telling me, oh, you're, you're such a, you're such a, you know, bad general. Well, how did I ever get you to be my general? And my line is, you killed all the others, my queen. <laughs> so that's how I got to be the general. She killed all the others. So Let's look at the next picture. Yeah, but is it a fiction? <laughs> oh, no, I, it's all fiction. No, but I, 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 do all, these, have a chance all these sea creatures are no, real. No, <laughs> actually, it is, of course, yes, it is a fiction. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, it had like 40 different rewrites. Uh, he wrote it. And it's actually part of a trilogy, so there'll be three movies. Mm. There's this movie, and they're, they're already working in production of the second one. But by the way, this movie will come out in summer of 2011 worldwide. 2011 yep. worldwide? Mm -hmm. and it'll be, but it'll be a big hit in China, I guarantee you. I mean, uh, but yeah, it took, took five hours to do the makeup. So You're all green, and you have a fin on your head, and then they apply makeup after that? Uh, well, this is how you normally look. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, they they had to tone down the green that I normally am to to a little brownish green. But uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So so you're this big action star, 56. Yeah, and so I'm on the I'm on the set and we're doing the fight scene and I'm working with a, a stunt man. So that I'm supposed to be fighting the Holly King, but the the stunt double is who I'm fighting because the close ups on me. And so it's a young Chinese guy who's the stunt double, and I and he sees me and he thinks like you know he's going to hurt me. So he's supposed to kick me in the chest. So, kick so you in the chest. he's supposed to kick me in the chest, and I, I fly far. Ac I fly across the, the the stage when he does that. But uh, but he would he kept going up and going to kick me and not making contact, you know, and and so it didn't look real because he, you know, even though I was you, saying right? it, it wasn't it wasn't enough action on his part. So I asked the director. I said, "What's wrong?" And he said he goes and talks to the young kid who's the who's the stunt man, and he says, "Well, he's afraid he'll hurt you." You know, I mean, I'm as old as his father. He's afraid if he kicks me, he'll hurt me. So I, I told him, I, I told the director, I said, well, get all the stunt guys over here. So he got them all over. And I looked at him and I said, and I put on my best general face and voice. Whoa. And I said, uh, listen, I may be 56 years old, but I can kick any one of you guys' butts. And, and there was dead silence because the Chinese didn't know what to say. You know, I, know I was joking if I was serious. And all of a sudden, everybody started laughing. And so uh, then we go to shoot the scene. The camera's rolling. The director says, action. And he kicks me in the chest and I go flying. I mean, really flying and then he runs over to me because he's afraid he hurt me you know so sorry. he's like oh i'm so sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry you're hurt and i was like no 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 it's fine so i put on a brave face but then when i got back to my hotel room that night i did take quite a lot of pain medicine <laughs> <laughs> two years after the movie supposedly wrapped there was still no word on when it would be released that was until october of 2012 when a trailer appeared on the web to a mostly confused reaction the cast had moved on and were doing their own thing at that point 
but Max recalls bumping into Yang at the Santa Monica Beach Hotel, where he was surprised and incredibly baffled to notice a few promotional posters for Empires of the Deep littered around the actual hotel. Apparently there he made amends with Yang, but still wasn't paid for the final three months of shooting. Fast forward to 2014, when the movie looked set to release again. Politis was invited to a screening in LA, which was to be followed by his appearance at Cannes to promote the movie, but shortly after, he was asked to do a small favour. Just a tiny small favour. Fly back to China to do some reshoots. And the Cannes appearance never even materialised. Politis' hair at the point of reshoots obviously looked completely different, so they just ended up gluing a fucking wig to his head. Then the reshoots were finally completed, and the cast moved on with their lives once again. Then things went quiet for a little while, until Empires of the Deep appeared on a Chinese crowdfunding website in 2016, where they attempted to raise around $150,000. They failed. In the meantime, Max Morlian and Steve Politis went back to their day jobs, not having fulfilled their dream of becoming major Hollywood stars. And in the promo featured on the crowdfund, Max Morlian and Jonathan Lawrence weren't even mentioned in the credits. Things have been dead silent since then, but now, after the continuous struggle, maybe one day we'll finally get to see Jonathan Yang's grand vision realised on the big screen, but for now we'll just have to wait. But Jonathan Lawrence summed up his ordeal with the movie and all the trouble surrounding it in an interview he did with Vice earlier last year. He said that, at this point in life, I am removed from any bitterness or resentment of anything that went wrong, and I've made peace with my own shortcomings on the project. I was nobody at that time. Probably still am, but that's okay, because I'm still having a good time making movies. <laughs>